Um, I will start the clock watching. Yeah, good day, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. I know there are other interesting talks that are taking place right now in the other rooms, but you are here, so uh, I appreciate your attendance. And by the way, uh, it's the last uh, talk before uh, the lunch, so, and, and I see you're hungry, hungry for the knowledge, hungry for the additional uh, Spring-based technology session. Uh, so today we're going to talk about the Spring Cloud AWS and upgrade and customization for over 100 teams. Anybody who have heard about Spring Cloud AWS or been using it? Yeah, one hand for Machi. <laughs> no, there is more. Okay. For others, uh, we will cover the basics, so don't worry. Uh, it's nice technology we're going to talk about. Uh, to introduce, for, for the context, why I'm here, uh, to introduce myself, uh, I'm Maxim Telepchuk. I'm software engineer at Akkad Technology, and I'm a member of a team uh, that develops something we call uh, productivity libraries. The naming you might find a bit boastful, uh, but it's just the way uh, I'm going to refer to those libraries. Uh, hopefully, it was on the Tom uh, session uh, this morning, so it's a good reference also for me uh, to talk about this, uh, the platform uh, stuff and other things. So basically, those libraries are responsible for easy integration uh, of applications with the underlying engineering platform. So we have the engineering platform underneath. Uh, also with the Spring products and many more we, we will see uh, to, uh, today. And actually, this product is used by hundreds of software engineers at our organization. And recently, we started introducing the latest version of Spring Cloud AWS. And the reason why I'm here is to share the experience, uh, how we uh, do such, an such a big upgrade, not only, not only this specific one, uh, as it turned out, it was uh, a, a bit challenging, but in general, uh, to share this, uh, this experience and how to do it in a big organization that de needs to keep tech stack fresh. Another reason why I'm here is the timeline. So today is a Spring IO conference made of 2024. The last version of Spring Cloud AWS version 2 was re released uh, early 2023. Uh, then we met uh, end of support for Spring Boot uh, 2 in November 23. And if you use commercial version of Spring Boot, you will um, meet the same deadline and, uh, next year in August. And the main reason why why this talk happening now is that uh, Java SDK v1 uh, will meet end of support uh, at the end of next year, so we we should be prepared for that. So we're going to talk about the Spring Cloud AWS, why we use it, what problem does it solve, uh, and uh, then we uh, I will just scratch our surface with the productivity libraries that we built on top of Spring Cloud AWS. We will break down Spring Cloud AWS 3 upgrade and related stacks, why it's challenging and uh, uh, what, is, what, is, what lessons were learned. And uh, at the end, I've prepared a uh, short demonstration. We will see the code, uh, how we customize the Spring Cloud AWS uh, for the specific business problem, which is multi-tenancy in SQS uh, communicating uh, application. Yeah, so let's start from Spring Cloud AWS. So, my organization is behind uh, e-commerce software, automated warehouse solution, root optimizers, logistic operations, and systems. And this big, uh, big uh, business uh, should be uh, should be running, and we're running it by the running applications. So most of the times we use Spring Boot uh, and Spring products for the applications, and we run them, of course, on the cloud. Uh, we use Azure and GCP, but our main um, main platform for running applications is AWS, and we should find a way how to integrate those two worlds with the Spring uh, Spring applications and AWS uh, cloud platform. Uh, so, who of you have been using AWS? Okay, some of oh, the most of you. Okay, uh, nice. So, how how we can do this? How we do this integration? Uh, the natural thing is to use the AWS SDK. This is not uh, related to Spring only, it's uh, just uh, a Java SDK. There is also programming languages that are supported. Uh, and this is just a set of, uh, set of uh, modules uh, that you can just add to your application and let's say integrate with the queue messaging system, with um, databases, and so on. But 
there are actually some challenges when using crawl uh, AWS SDK, uh, to name only few of them. Um, first of all, it's there are additional configurations that is always needed, like you need to provide the credentials, the region that you're working on, uh, configure all the clients. You need to do that all on the all of the environments you're running your applications. So that's that's something this boiler boilerplate that's uh, appearing there. And uh, also, s we d discovered that simple operations might get complicated. Like, let's say I want to send the message to my QE, having it the queue name and the message itself, and I need to do four steps. So I need to um, do the request for getting URL, uh, get that URL, then use that URL to send the message, and f to, uh, like create a request from it, and then send like boilerplate. It, that's nice. So that's SDK. It's like a kind of agnostic uh, techno uh, technology agnostic solution. But we will see the better examples of of, of using it. And as you can see, there is no idioms that Spring developers are used to. Uh, there are no annotations. I know not everybody likes the annotations, but if you're working with the Spring Boot, you should be kind of used to it. Um, there is no, as I said, there is no simple services that I can do th those basic operations in one line of code. And there is no uh, serialization and deserialization available right out of the box. Uh, you need to remember that you're not working on the Java object. You always need to remember to convert this to, let's say, JSON. And then when you when you send to let's say Q messenger system, and on the hand on the other point you're receiving that message, you need to deserialize this JSON to Java object, which is uh, again something we can do better. And that's when uh, uh, Spring Cloud AWS uh, comes in the game. Um, this it, please don't uh, um, like uh, be confused by the name. It's not related to Spring Cloud, and uh, it's also uh, developed and maintained by the community, and it's not affiliated with the Amazon or uh, VMware Broadcom. But it's uh, listed on the official page of Spring products, so it deserves our attention. And what it does, it offers a convenient way to interact with AWS provided services using well-known Spring idioms and APIs. Not all of the APIs, only the chosen ones, so you, you see, uh, but those are popular ones, like S3, SQS, for queues, for notifications, SNS, DynamoDB. So yeah, you, we, can, we can use it in our application. And it could be seen kind of like additional abstraction layer over AWS SDK. And as I said, not for all, all the APIs. And the benefits that you, you get is, as I said, Spring idioms and APIs for AWS. It configures SDK clients and also allows their customization. So when you just paste, uh, like, uh, add uh, Spring Cloud AWS modules to your class path, uh, you right away can use the clients only by passing some of the environment variables that are needed uh, for the credentials, for the region. It's actually configured and you can use it. Uh, it also provides convenient services for integration with the AWS. We're going to see the examples uh, on the next slide. It provides the useful annotations, also examples on the next slide, and it all comes on top of AWS SDK. So even if you don't want to use those APIs that Spring Cloud AWS provides, you still can just use those SDK clients that are pre-configured, which is, again, convenient. These are examples. Let's say S3 is the, uh, the service from AWS for storing objects. And let's say I have the URL to my object, and I want just to have it in my bin in my class as a resource. And if I want to do it with the SDK, it will be um, it will be a lot of code. But with this uh, uh, starter from Spring Cloud AWS, I can just use a well-known at value annotation and inject my uh, S3 uh, S3 resource in my bin. Then let's say for SQS. Um, we have uh, this nice annotation SQS listener where you can just list the queues that you want to listen on and don't, if you, if you had experience with the SQS SDK and uh, whenever you want to uh, receive the message, you need to uh, just call this, uh, this, like, I want to, like, polling, I want to receive that message. In this case, you just 
add this annotation and whenever the message is on your QE, it will be uh, like sent to your, uh, uh, to your method and you can handle it like just the regular uh, method uh, arguments. And in this case, we're just uh, handling by uh, logging it. Another example is um, some sendings. Uh, let's say I want to send notification to SNS. And uh, as you can see, I can use here Java objects. And those are serialized by uh, Spring Cloud AWS to the chosen format. In this case, it's JSON. And I don't use um, mm, uh, here a big uh, operation call calls. It's just two lines of code, three lines of code that I can uh, Communicate, communicate with the SNS. And the same for uh, SQS. Um, you've seen the example before. Uh, a, big, a, big, uh, num uh, a big chunk of code uh, for sending message. Here you can use this one, uh, this few lines of code uh, with the SQS template from Spring Cloud AWS that will allow you to um, also use this nice fluent builder-like uh, interface to send your to send your uh, message. So to few uh, to name a few takeaways from from this section, Spring Cloud AWS is the abstraction over the chosen AWS APIs. It provides Spring IDMs and APIs for AWS, and SDK can be used along Spring Cloud AWS. So AWS Spring Cloud AWS just adding things, not uh, like getting it from you. Okay, so now, now quickly about the productivity libraries. Uh, just a short recap from the introduction. is a software maintained and utilized exclusively within the company. Uh, it's used by software engineers, so when I call the users, uh, those users are our software engineers. And we provide modules that help users fulfill uh, their needs and boost their productivity. You will see the examples uh, how we uh, how it's how it's been used, and uh, it could be seen as additional abstraction layer, but it's really thin. We we try to keep it thin um, uh, for the users. That allows consume elements of engineering platform. So again, our di diagram in the productivity libraries, and you can see that um, uh, some of the APIs that are not supported by Spring Cloud AWS uh, are. Uh, covered in our libraries because we, let's say, use Kinesis and we don't use ECS in our case, so we don't have this module for ECS. That's one of the reasons why we need them as well. But it's not only about the cloud platform. Uh, if we shrink those two layers to bottom layers, like this, uh, you will see that uh, engineering platform is not only a cloud running platform, it's also the security and it's also observability and other platform components. So we provide those modules that the user can just add to class path and integrate with those, with those uh, components. So that's the main reason why we need that. It provides convenient abstractions over the complex integrations. It also facilitates the smooth upgrades for the tools with a different, different development speed. Let's say, uh, just like Tom uh, talked uh, today in the morning, uh, we have this dependency management, uh, common dependency management uh, system that controls the versions in the in the company's applications. And let's say whenever there is a uh, there is a zero day exploits discovered, uh, we just upgrade the versions, and our users are used to upgrade quickly, so they can upgrade. Most of our users can upgrade the same or the next day. Uh, and we also implement the required conventions across the organization. Let's say we have imagined that all the applications in the organization needs to expose some of the health check uh, in the chosen convention. And we just provide the module uh, that will expose that uh, health check. And whenever this convention is changing, the user just change the version of the, of the tool. There are also downsides, like there is, as I said, abstraction layer that users need to learn and remember what's going on. Maintenance cost, because it's, uh, there is a team dedicated that maintain that libraries. 
and it's also hard to find the balance between introducing new things into this, this abstraction and just configuring underlying uh, underlying uh, integrations. And that's the last slide uh, on that section. So despite being the opt-in solution, users don't need to uh, use our, uh, our libraries. It's opt-in. But those are still have high adoption, because we provide about 100 modules that covers many aspects of the, of the user case uh, scenarios. And out of more than 600 applications uh, on the production, not mentioning even the other environments, because we have about 1.3k uh, 1 1 applications on the all environments, but production environments, we have uh, 600 applications or so, and 70% of them are using those modules, right? despite being opt-in. And about 75% out of 180 teams uh, are used our modules. And this fun fact, uh, Spring Boot 3.2 is used in more uh, than 75% of the applications that are using our tool. And we believe uh, after this uh, release of 3.3, .3, we will have the high adoption in a short time. So those libraries pro uh, simplify the integrations with the engineering platform. They enable standardized stack for a big number of teams. And the tech stack is up to date while the upgrades are smooth and we can you know, fix the zero date exploits just in a few days uh, on the most of the applications. Now, the upgrade to the latest version of Spring Cloud AWS 3. Mm. The new version of Spring Cloud AWS brings a lot of a lot new uh, stuff. First of all, it brings the support for Spring Boot 3, which is nice. Uh, AWS SDK V2 is something that is uh, s supported by uh, Spring Cloud AWS 3. Again, nice because we saw that V1 will meet the um, the the end of support next year. There are more flexible configurations. There are more properties. Um, uh, and configuration bins that you, that you can use to configure your um, to tune your your application. New capabilities like uh, new APIs for DynamoDB. Uh, uh, in the SQS world, there was uh, improvements over the the async operations and the batching uh, operations. And it, there is also better performance. That's something uh, we tested on the SQS listener by tuning those two, uh, those two parameters, the performance. Uh, we see the improvement on that side. But there are also challenges. So it's compatible with the Spring Boot 3 only. And it's compatible with, with AWS SDK v2 only. Uh, you will see why is the challenge. So uh, there is also a big change in the way how Spring Cloud AWS looks like. And uh, the, it's natural that there are many undiscovered effects of the new configurations. So when it's changing, when the, when the tool is changing, it's natural that we don't know how those moving parts are behaves. And uh, some of the APIs are completely rewritten, like SQS sending um, mechanism uh, that has different interfaces. Uh, some of the APIs are stopped be stop being supported, like RDS and Elastic Cache. And version 2 and 3 can be used on the same app. So when you see those challenges and you are working in the Agile team, uh, you might ask the question, why is even the challenge? Why is the I, I working with the Spring Boot 3? Uh, you said that SDK v1 will be deprecated. I will be used SDK v1. I will handle all of this other stuff, all the other challenges. Why is the problem? It's maybe not a big problem if you're working within one team, but it's, it's more than 100 teams. You might notice the challenges. So software engineers need to upgrade to Spring Boot 3, which is uh, just one, one this challenge is ch very challenging itself. Uh, upgrades. Uh, we need to upgrade all of the APIs uh, to SDK v2 at the same time, right? Uh, we, uh, we need to upgrade all of the APIs from Spring Cloud AWS. So if you use this abstraction, nice services from Spring Cloud AWS, 
Now they are changing and we need to change them as well and the way how they are customized. For our productivity libraries maintainers uh, team, it, we also need to upgrade to Spring Boot 3, guide the users on the changes because we are responsible for integrating those products. Uh, we need to upgrade all of the APIs and SDK and prepare the platform integrations for the new stack. And this all should happen at the same time for over 400 applications and 100 teams. Of course, in the worst scenario, which is, um, might be mind-blowing, it's very hard to achieve and uh, it's, it's introduced the technical depth uh, that could you know, run for weeks just to use all of those things uh, at the same time. Yeah, I mean, uh, at the same time, at all of that points should be done in particular application at the same time, and it should be happen for all of the applications. And because our, uh, yeah, that's nice question, uh, so uh, nice point. Uh, so because our users update quickly, uh, we will just have uh, users on the support, like uh, tens of them, uh, like next day after we re release it. So maybe not all of them, but uh, major part. So this is kind of, uh, the process that we we need to optimize, like we want to find the solution how we uh, how we optimize that upgrade, and this is kind of our don't how know how approach. So what do we optimize for? Of course, we optimize for the agility. Uh, imagine you have this pile of boxes you need to uh, just uh, move to other room, and instead of just getting all of them, you get one by one. So we break. We try to break, we will see the examples, we try to break, break these big upgrades into the smaller ones so you can do this one upgrade at a time. We also uh, uh, keep uh, the, the versions available parallelly. There is nothing about uh, the multi-threading stuff. It's just the user can choose between the versions of the tool and in, in a combination with the switching API by API, uh, it's very useful for the user that user can uh, uh, switch API by API. Let's say w user has three APIs to, to switch and user have time to switch S3, SQS, and then the manager com comes in and said, um, maybe technical depth is not something we need to focus on now, so please do the business problems and then you go and upgrade your SNS uh, service. For us, as a maintainer team uh, of productivity libraries, it's also a way to being agile because we need to prepare those, uh, uh, to those integrations as well. We, we keep the feature parity and simplicity when it makes sense. So there is an example that in the old version of the tool, there was a service with some method that our users used to. And in the new, uh, uh, new version of it, there are nice methods, but that but kind of do the same underneath. And uh, it's called different. It implements different interfaces. So for the easier integration, for the easier upgrade, we introduce some of the abstractions that looks like the old version that we can remove in the future. But for the upgrade, the user can just use our service and uh, th th remove th that service in the next step when, when, it, uh, when it has time. We keep our modules highly configurable. Those annotations like auto configurations and conditional missing bin uh, means that we configure uh, the things for the user only in case they need to, they need those configurations and they don't have those configurations by themselves. And we keep our uh, pro uh, property tree um, also configurable. Um, let's say user don't want to disable some of the features or configure something with the primitive types. So we just enable to do that. And we keep uh, mi mistake resistance uh, mechanism like class path validation and property validation. What it does is, let's say we see as a tool that a uh, user uh, using uh, the, diff the uh, weird combination of the modules, let's say uh, SQS of version one and version two, 
and it might lead to the confusion because the same SQS listener annotation coming from different uh, tools, and the user might be confused by that. So we run, uh, so we um, fail application on the on the startup. So it's it's not um, it's not it's not affect their they drop in the future. Let's say they have um, uh, automatic upgrade tools like Renovate and they just skip the release and notes. So that's just the for the for the mis mistake resistance. The same with the properties. So we know we see that some of the properties are outdated. So we see we, we can say that okay we see that you're still using it please switch to the other ones. Of course, those, those mistake resistance mechanism could be switched off in case, in case user might find they unuseful. To give you more, uh, more specifics, the challenges in our solutions. So the challenge was uh, it was impossible to use Spring Cloud AWS 2 with the latest Spring dependencies, right? We want to move to Spring Boot 3, but we're still using Spring Cloud AWS 2. And we solved that by upgrading parts of Spring Cloud AWS that we are using uh, to the latest Spring. And uh, it's only for internal usage only, so you won't find it anywhere on the, on the internet. Uh, but um, it works for us, at least. And it uh, allows us to move to the Spring Boot 3. Another challenge is that upgrade to Spring Boot 3 requires multiple changes in the way tech stack is used. Uh, yeah, Lauren, you uh, will t will have a talk about this, uh, so we'll cover this topic later today. And uh, actually, we release those productivity libraries in the milestone versions uh, that are compatible with the Spring Boot 3. Uh, we also discovered those things that are going wrong. Um, we observe the adoption, provide details, upgrade instructions, and make made decision on that. SDK v1. Uh, uh, another challenge is that, as I said, SDKv1 will be uh, deprecated soon, and all of the APIs need to migrate to a new version of it. And that's why we introduce new modules, a parallel that, uh, I mean, they run in parallel, that mean, meaning that the user can choose between them, between the different versions that are compatible with, with the Spring Cloud AWS 3, new SDK, and with allowing the switching API by API. So this is our recipe for upgrading to Spring Cloud AWS 3, in case you are here for that. Most important upgrades that we've done. <coughs> this is our journey we, we, we have made. So first of all, we upgraded to the latest Java uh, 17. Then we upgraded to the Spring Security uh, last pre-6 version uh, to be prepared for a Spring Boot 3 upgrade. Uh, we did that uh, in the Spring Cloud AWS as well. In combination with the previous step, the, the Spring Security 6 upgrade was very easy. And here comes the upgrade for the Spring Cloud AWS for, let's say, S3 only. So we choose only one API, we upgrade it, and then we started getting prepared for the Spring Boot 3.2 by, uh, you know that in Spring Boot 3.2 there are virtual threads, so it requires uh, Java 21. So we upgraded to Java 21. Then in the mid meantime, we upgraded SQS, the another API uh, to the latest SQS, uh, Spring Cloud AWS uh, 3. Then we upgraded to Spring Boot 3.2, then SNS and so on. So we can see that blue dots, blue, blue points are not related to those, to those others upgrades. And we can do it this asynchronously, like uh, they could be done step by step. Yeah, well, uh, this is the uh, one of uh, the, uh, those are, so the question are, uh, is, just to repeat, um, are those blue uh, points are our modules? Because I said that uh, Spring Cloud AWS doesn't uh, support running version 3 and 2, and the answer is yes. Um, these are our abstractions and our productivity libraries abstractions over those chosen APIs, and that's how we enable them uh, like switching API by API. So yeah. Yeah. 
Uh, like you can uh, you can upgrade uh, let's say SQS at first if it's done by us if it's the module is done and you can upgrade and still use uh, the abs our uh, abstraction over the let's say uh, other parts of the AWS in the version two of Spring Cloud AWS but upgrade one API to version three so that's something we enable. And uh, yeah, it's not supported by Spring Cloud AWS, so that's that's how it's w why it's convenient to have this additional layer. Okay, so what else is worth considering? Just a quick slide. Uh, of course, we heavily invest in the documentation and the upgrade guides. Uh, we can communicate with the users through the different challenge uh, channels like articles, interviews, uh, guides. And uh, we keep the contact with the technology maintainers. Uh, on the AWS side, we have strong contact uh, company level in case we have doubts about AWS and SDK in particular. And uh, technology maintainers of Spring Cloud AWS, we had the contact with uh, Thomas Fernandez, another, uh, another m one of the core contributor to Spring Cloud AWS, because we have doubts ad about something I will show later in the, on the slides. We gather many data and we use it in the decision pro making process. That's how we know this adoption and these numbers that I've shown you at the beginning. But I, d I don't have a time to talk about all this. Uh, there is dedicated uh, talk uh, from the previous year uh, conference, Spring.io, where Jacek and Fabio break this down. Any question? No? Okay. To wrap up, uh, so those big upgrades, even if they are big, they could be done in agile way. Remember about that. Ju you, you should only find a way. This is our summary for uh, this particular upgrade. And if you know those uh, things that are coming, if you know that this big waterfall is coming, you can just break it uh, into, the, in the st into the steps and be more agile. You just uh, need to prepare early. Uh, with the parallel run and API by API switching. So the, la the last uh, section, uh, the demo, the code, the most fun uh, section. Okay, this is this was inspired by the Thomas Vitalis talk about the multi-tenancy. And even though you're not using uh, multi-tenancy, you still might be interested in the in the how the way how it's working. Uh, in this particular case, uh, multi is used for the cost reduction uh, purposes, but context might be passed in the other re for the other reasons as well. And there will be a little gacha moment uh, that Spring Cloud AWS uh, needs an unusual approach to ensure this multi is working, in the, at least in the servlet uh, world. You will see this uh, this particular uh, challenge. As I said, multi tenancy is not the only one I th think we can focus on. Usually you want to if you might want to pass the context between the applications, let's say some ID for the tracing, anything. And uh you basically we want to set this uh this context, pass it to a, another application and retrieve it whenever we need it. And uh, uh it should be done automatically, so the user of our modules don't do it by itself. Uh, yeah. In this case, we pass the tenant ID for the context, and we should do it in the context of request. So what does it mean? Let's say we have four applications, and three of them uh, are hitting our fourth applications with all of different uh, contexts, uh, contexts uh, uh, like tenant ID, different tenant ID with the different APIs, uh, so it makes ha even harder. And we are using servlets here, uh, so we have each thread that working with a different context. And uh, we will see the example how we do this with the SQS, and you can uh, apply this knowledge to the other APIs as well. So let's say the flow, we want to send uh, in first place uh, the, the message. So let's say the, our application receives some message 
with the tenant ID, this blue dot that you will see. Uh, and uh, yeah, just we will send it through the console through the REST endpoint. And uh, our application needs to set it in the local context. And then when it's ready, it needs to pass, uh, let's say, the message to the SQS, Q messaging system. And it should be automatically be able to automatically pass the context in the attributes, in the message attributes. So when we send the message, we want to receive that. So let's say another application will receive the message uh, with this particular blue dot, which is tenant ID, retrieve that tenant ID, set it in the local context, and then handle it, I don't know, maybe send to another application, or maybe just handle it in the logs, whatever. You can see that blue dot is just flowing throughout our flow, and uh, it's basically uh, what our um, pro libraries are doing. For the sake of our demo, we will use just the one application. So it will be the same application that will send and receive. So it will be simple for you to understand. Yeah, the code. I I, I'm using the local stack, the local instance of AWS. And the, I just set up um, the QE that is on my on my local machine. I get this inspiration for my QE from Tom from uh, uh, morning session. And you don't name those QEs like this. Only conference speakers can do that. And uh, we have this simple build. Yeah, maybe this uh, build Gradle file. So we, we here we inject the Maven bomb uh, from Spring Cloud AWS. And we use the latest version of it. Uh, we uh, add uh, the starter web uh, st uh, starter uh, because we want to expose REST endpoints and uh, Spring Cloud AWS starter SQS for SQS communication. Is it visible for you? Okay. So now uh, we want to do our flow. We want to expose the REST client and do the REST or the REST client uh, REST endpoint, of course. So we have the controller. When we receive our message body, we pass the tenant ID through the path variable, nothing uh, sophisticated. And then tenant ID is set in the tenant context. We will see this in a minute. And we send the, the message with the SQS template wrapper. As I said, SQS template is something that comes from Spring Cloud AWS, but we need to wrap it, and you, you will see why. So tenant context is just a simple class uh, that use thread locals for keeping uh, the context. This is also in the inspiration from Thomas Vitalis' talk. Uh, and this will keep the thread specific value for, for, for tenant ID. We can set and get it. And uh, yeah, and now, that now we have SQS template wrapper. So wrapper means uh, here is the SQS template from Spring Cloud AWS with nice um, uh, methods you can see, you can send, you can even receive with this, with, this with this class. But before we send, we want to somehow pre-process message. And the way we pre-process is our some pre-processor. It's called post-processor, post but don't be confused by that. It's just the interface from, I believe, uh, yeah, Spring Framework Messaging. So we need to, in our preprocessor, we get our tenant, <coughs> tenant context, and we pass it, as I said, in the headers, the attributes, they are the same, it's just different names uh, coming from Spring Messaging and AWS World. So we set this context in the attributes. So we've done this. So we expose the uh, the REST endpoint. We set it in the local context. We pass it to SQS so we can send it. Uh, we pass it in the attributes so we can send it. Hopefully, it wasn't so complicated for you. It's uh, just three uh, three classes. In case you have questions, just shout them. And I will run our simple applications. <coughs> Now it started, and uh, now I want to send 
some message to my rest endpoint. Here I will just choose some uh, tenant with the chosen message. Content type is text plain, nothing sophisticated. And when I send it, and we'll check my logs I've prepared, uh, we can see that, okay, we received rest call with a given tenant ID. The tenant ID is set in the message <laughs> attributes and m the message is sent to SQS in the, in the headers, so we can see it. Now, when I stop the application, even if I stop the application, remember that this sent to uh, QE, so the, there is a message that is waiting for, for, for being received. So let's receive it. For this, we will use SQS listener annotation. You've seen this in the example. It's nice annotation from Spring Cloud AWS. I'm just list. Uh, I'm using Spring uh, uh, Express. Uh, Spring uh, Express language here, and uh, whenever, as I said, whenever there is a message on the queue, I will be handle. I will handle it in my method as a uh, method arguments. So here I will. Uh, retrieved, I want to retrieve the tenant context and let's say handle it, let's say log it uh, w w with the message. But who will set that tenant ID? Who, like, uh, if I will just run it like this, the tenant context will be empty. That's why we need to, before this thing is handled, we need to intercept in that process of handling and that is again something that comes from Spring Cloud AWS, the message interceptor that allows you to do something before the uh, the SQS listener method was called and after it, let's say in case you need a cleanup. In this case we will just do the before action uh, with the intercept method. We will retrieve the header, uh, our tenant ID uh, that we passed and we set in the tenant context, so here it won't be empty and uh, we can get it. So that's how it, this Spring Cloud AWS works. First of all, it runs the interceptors before actions, then it's uh, run this handling, handling uh, method, and then the after actions. So uh, if we will run this particular uh, part of the flow, and you see I received the message because it was all of the time it was waiting on the SQS. So my SQS listener <coughs> connected to SQS see that, that there is a message and just handle it. So we received the SQS uh, message from SQS QE, retrieve the tenant ID, set tenant ID in the local context and handle it through the logging. But there is a little gotcha moment with the with the with the Spring Cloud AWS. So basically you need to know okay maybe uh, just to sum up this one. So interceptor, message interceptor. This is something that uh, Spring Cloud AWS supports and uh, you know this is the mechanism from Spring Cloud AWS. It allows you to do the actions before the message received also after it is received but there are thread switches that are possible. And uh, for uh, the Spring Cloud AWS, heavily uh, re like based on the async operations, like completable futures, and you may s you may know that you c should be careful with the completable futures and thread locals because th there could be thread switching on that. Um, there are, there is also conditional new thread supplying in uh, Spring Cloud AWS. So if you will see underlying. Uh, uh, structure of Spring Cloud AWS, wi which I recommend always to do when you use some tool. You can see that uh, there is a condition where uh, the operation might be supplied in the same thread and sometimes in the it's, it might be supplied in the new thread. That's something we want to avoid and we want it to be extra careful about. So, uh, yeah, because of those uh, things and these structures, uh, thread local might be lost. Uh, so that's why we used the wrapping handler method, something that comes from uh, Spring Messaging uh, uh, framework. And it's basically what we want to do here is just replace 
the method, let, let, let me show you the SQL listener again. So we want to replace that method with the another one that just wrapping uh, this, this our method. So we want, okay, I know that it should be executed, but before that, I want something to be executed, like the interceptor before action, and I want something like clean up after this. And please do this in the same thread. So you can just create your custom handler method where you call those interceptors, invoke the handler method that was underneath that this SQS listener method we annotated, and we do do some cleanups. And of course, here you need to turn off the Spring Cloud AWS message interceptors. So this way, and it's uh, it looks like ugly workaround, but it's actually consulted with uh, with uh, uh, Thomas Fernandez from uh, Spring Cloud AWS. Uh, he's he's uh, one of the guys who is behind the SQS uh, tools in Spring Cloud AWS. So that's something uh, we need to apply just to be careful with the thread locals. And yeah, it's, 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 on, it's uh, based on Spring messaging uh, mechanism, but it's consulted that it's OK to use it. Um, the actions might be, uh, be executed before the message received and the uh, there is no uh, thread switches in between. Yeah, so to wrap up, um, there are many customization options that are available in the Spring Cloud AWS and allows you to solve your business problems easily, but you should be aware, always be aware about the underlying uh, structure of the tools you are using. In case of Spring Cloud AWS, be aware of underlying thread switches and async operations. <coughs> to leave you with the final thoughts, Consider, at least consider Spring Cloud AWS if you integrate with the Spring applications, uh, if you integrate your Spring, Spring applications with AWS. Also consider introducing those libraries that we've talked about if you work in a, a big organization which needs to keep the wider tech stack fit. And always remember to be agile even when doing a big upgrades. Uh, look ahead of the time, try to see the events that are coming, and this will always pay back. Thank you for your attention. Thank you for coming. Yep, you can clap. <laughs> in case you, in case you have questions, you can uh, ask them now or catch me on the lunch or ask them on the LinkedIn. Yeah. yeah? If I understood correctly, yeah. uh, your library like, mm -hmm. uh, works with thread locals. Yeah. Yeah. Th that's nice because almost everything in thread locals. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Spring Web Plus, how does your library work in this kind of scenario since you are using thread local? So uh, the great question, how we uh, allow other teams that uh, decided to go with the reactive programming instead of instead of uh, the servlet applications. Uh, so we always uh, try to see the demand that, up, that our users uh, have. And if we see that we have the contact, we have the points of contact with, the, with our users so they can reach us, uh, let's say, on the support channel. And in case they have uh, this de demand, we can prepare a module for that. But in fact, we see that 99% of our users are using servlets and they are fine with this, with this module. Uh, even uh, like ha having uh, the fact that virtual threads uh, came into into the game, so that's uh, that's also another um, thing to stay with this servlet uh, structure, and uh, don't g without going into this complex reactive programming. If there will be demand, we can uh, prepare the module, but we don't see this demand. Yeah. Thank you for the question. Mm -hmm. well, and now you used this, yeah, what are those, those I, I don't know that notation is a um, bracket, what is that notation? Uh, it's just a name and time and it traces with your body. Yeah, so... Um, 
Yeah, yeah, it's just uh, yeah, it's just in the example. Uh, I I need to use here dollar and uh, this. Okay. That. <laughs> Yeah, no, it's it's it. You need to paste it uh, or use. Uh, I'm not sure if it supports Spring expression uh, expression language. Hopefully, it does. Yep. So yeah, um, <laughs> it will be better if I will use Spring expression language in, instead of these square uh, brackets. <laughs> yeah, thanks. Yeah. Yeah. Mm. Yeah. For uh, for the tracing, uh, yeah, actually we do we do some tracings. So uh, you we we uh, I showed you the multi tenancy because it's something uh, yeah it's something that uh, is recognizable. But uh, we on that path with the multi tenancy, so it's not uh, widely adopted uh, in our organization uh, yet. Uh, but we use. The same, uh, the similar uh, case for the tracing. For in our case, for the tracing of the request, so we just request is created, and we can uh, just pass this request ID through the application, so we can. Uh yeah. Hmm. That's great to meet somebody who uh, who made the same problem. Great. Thank you. Thank you for coming. In case of further questions, just catch me anywhere. Okay. Thank you.